Hello, I'm Mike, and this is going to be my review of the Anycubic i3 Mega. I've had this printer now for about eight or nine months, and I've used it a few times on this channel. Firstly, I made a build and print video, and then it appeared in a few of my crafting things and making miniature crater bases. I said when I got it, I'd be interested in reviewing it, and now I finally got round to do it. So we'll get started. I'll kick off with the basic specs so we know what we're working with. It's an FDM type printer which is fused deposition modelling like pretty much any low budget 3D printer around. It's all standard stuff. At the moment it's retailing for around 220 to 230 quid from what I can see. So that's the sort of price range you're looking at. Build volume is 210mm by 210mm in the X and Y and then it's 205mm high build volume with the whole machine coming in at 410mm across, 475mm back and 458mm high. It's got a heated bed, we're talking max temperature claimed at 100 degrees although I've not tested that to its limits and it links up either a USB link to a computer or an SD card and the interface is touchscreen. It's working materials, it claims to work with PLA, ABS, HOPS and wood effect materials and it has two features which I've seen advertised enough to be worth mentioning. One is the ultra base which we'll get a quick look at here. The claim of the ultra base is that it's a glass plate with a microporous surface so it has good adhesion when hot but when it cools down the part can pretty much pop off without much effort. The other feature is an auto resume feature so if there's a power cut and the printer turns itself off when it comes back on it should be able to automatically restart a print. I'll start then with assembly which was very simple. The printer is technically a kit but it's basically half put together. The internal wiring is done, the timing belts are set up and the base was already attached to the print bed here. The only thing you really needed to do was screw a couple of screws in to attach the metal frame to the top, finish off the last of the wires and build a holder for the filament. From a software side things might get slightly more difficult. I prefer the approach of sticking a file on an SD card and leaving the printer to its own devices. If you want to have a wired connection to the PC I'd recommend finding reviews on that alone as I don't do that and don't have the skills to judge if the printer is good for this. The manual comes with suggested slicer settings and these worked alright for me when I was using Cura. But from what I've read, it works with other slicing software, it's fairly fine. With that in mind, it's worth mentioning the quality of some of the extras here. It's not vital and it's not what you pay your money for, but upon setting up, I think it's a good sign, so I'll mention this. The manual was decent, it's clear instructions and basic tips. So, nothing you won't read on any decent intro to 3D printing, but it did its job. The other bits are decent quality. I'll show you an example, I'll pick up this scraper here which came with the kit. I guess it's cheap to manufacture, it's cheap to do easily I suppose, but it's reasonable quality and it's the sort of stuff that lasts and this was the standard for a lot of the extras that came with the kit. The one that surprised me most was that the SD card came with it was genuinely 32 gigabytes. This is surprising to me because my instinct with SD cards especially when there's sort of extras in a cheap Chinese kit, is to view the numbers as about as accurate as a Greek tax return. So when it turns out that this thing was genuine, that was actually very nice. Probably the best bit though was that the printer I got came with a spare hot end. Now considering that's one of the bits that goes through the most sort of wear and tear in a printer, it's the bit that's heated up to the really high temperatures, it's good that it came with that spare. It seemed to be a well thought out kit build. But enough of that setting up, onto the most important thing, which is of course how well it prints. For illustration, I have a bench boat, which is, I think, a reasonable standard 3D printing test. And I'll start showing off some of the details. If I use a bit of a wash of paint, which will accentuate layer lines in this case. You can see 
uniformity of the lines and there was no major problems printing the test pieces. There are two things where certainly in the early prints it performed poorly. One of them is detail on the first layer. You know, sort of underneath the print does detail come out and the standard bench boat has a piece of writing on the bottom of it which as you can see completely failed. It seems to be something to do with standard heating settings on the bed. I think it just melted together unfortunately on this print and I have been getting better quality more recently with a bit of tweaking. The other thing was a slight problem with overhangs that it has. It did seem to leave a lot to be desired there. The curved and especially the flat overhang on the bench boat did leave a bit to be desired. This was however slightly improved again by learning a bit more by improving the settings but but considering how small that overhang was that wasn't very good standard and still even now while it does handle overhangs a lot better than when it started it's it shows its signs of being a low cost printer in that area overall with the printing quality i can show you a few of the other things i've made with it and for we are fairly simple standard parts. It prints fine, its quality is good, and it prints reliably as well. I think over my history of using this, I've had only three hairballs of doom. One was trying to print an incredibly large Millennium Falcon piece, which didn't work. Let's say I left it when I was away for a weekend and came back to a mess. There was one other when I put off re leveling the bed for too long, and it didn't like it and even one more piece which in this case I designed poorly it seems for most things it's fine it deals with it and it prints very well I don't think there's any time when I would have said this has failed and I expected it to do better it's always been if it fails it's because I've given it something that's either very difficult to do or was impossible to do because I made a mess of designing. So that's the basic results of some prints. So I'll go through some pros and cons now. On the pro side, the big thing is stability. I haven't seen another 3D printer in this price range that is this steady. And the reason for that is the way the axes are set up. On a lot of other printers, what you'll see is metal beams designed to fit T-nuts. Whereas on this one, you have a system of metal poles and sheet metal and I'll show you the advantage of this with a closer look. If I point you towards here what you can see is how the bed is set up on its frame. You can see the timing belt in the middle with two metal poles spread very wide over the base. Obviously this gives you a major advantage when it comes to stability. Because the metal poles are spread wide, the load is well spread, and this keeps the machine very stable. I'll show you another, the other two axes as well. The gantry that the hot end is held on is held on again by a timing belt with metal poles either side, which again makes it very steady. And the z-axis movement is probably one of the sturdiest parts of all. On each side, is a separate lead screw and motor, so it's motor powered from both sides, with a metal pole for extra stability. This means it is very hard for this to go off axis or wobble. Add to that the way the sheet metal frame is put together, this thing is incredibly sturdy, and that's one of its big strengths. I'd also say the ease of assembly, which I've already mentioned, is a pro, and some of the extra features, as I said, were good quality. One other little good thing is detecting if a roll of filament runs out. There's a small attachment down next to where the filament is entered, which just simply detects if there's filament still coming in through that point. And what it means is that it will detect if filament has run out before the print is ruined, and that can save you a couple of times if you catch it. The Ultra Base is, in my opinion, good, especially considering the price. It does what it says on the tin, for the most part it was keeping prints stuck and they come off easily. So that's the best of the pros. What about the cons? Firstly it's worth mentioning the build size. I don't really mind much about the height, but 210mm square for the base does look rather small when for not much more money you can get something like a CR10 or similar, which are far larger. 
I would also mention that while the ultra base is good, it isn't going to last forever. My one after eight months is slowly coming apart. As you can see, there's areas where it's been chipped back to glass, just roughly in the middle there, and some of the lower layers don't seem to be coming off as easily as they used to. This is fine, it's to be expected for the price, but it has the problem that once it starts losing the property of being easy to remove prints, you have to scrape more to remove the prints, which makes the surface worse, so you have to scrape more to remove the prints. And a few goes from this cycle means that it can go from, oh, it's not working like it used to, to, oh, God, I should replace this very quickly. It's good, 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 and then, like a battery on a mobile phone, suddenly crashes off from pretending it's almost full to gone. One last con that I think should be complained about is that it's tough to upgrade. As I said, a lot of other printers for this range use metal poles which can be fit with T-nuts. One of the things that that means is it's very easy to attach extras to the printer. The fact that this machine doesn't, also combined with the fact that the electronics are well hidden, they're tucked in this big box underneath the print bed, means that it can be a pain to upgrade. It also means that it might be more difficult to do replacements and simple fixes compared to other printers. So that's the best of pros and cons. What I think remains is the obvious question. Let's say you wanted to buy a 3D printer and you're looking at this low budget end of the market. Would you get this? And it's a tough one to answer and I can't pretend to be able to answer it for you. But I can make you ask a few questions that might tell you more about if this printer is right for you. The real toughness of answering is that the standard of 3D printers has improved so much over the past few years. A few years ago, the idea of a low-cost 3D printer, which put out decent quality prints with minimal fuss, would have been pretty much a miracle. It's brilliant. Now, that's the baseline. So while my review overall was very positive, I'm sure if I'd have got a different printer, I would have had a similar outlook saying, well, this is great. So what else is around? To give you a quick and by no means complete review, the printer cost me around 250 pounds at the time. And as I said before, retails around 220 to 230 at the moment. For around 70 pounds less, you could get something like say an Anet A8 or similar. A more painful setup, a far tougher kit to build, but you could probably get similar quality prints for less money. For around £30 less, you could get something like Reality Zender 3 or some of the other similar designs, like say Haynet ZT4, or I think TiVo have made something similar in that sort of style. It's more hassle, you lose the stability, but you gain a lot of money extra, it's a cheap machine. For a bit more you could get something that's completely built rather than kit almost built. So this printer is like say the Flash Forge Finder which has less space but is a completely pre-assembled kit if you're really not keen on doing your building. Or put an extra say 80 to 100 pounds on and you're starting to look at machines like say Creality CR10 you're starting to look at machines with a massive build volume. And if you start to spend more, even more money than that, then the i3 Mega's limitations of its price start really coming to the fore. If you're willing to spend that much more money, you might as well get a better machine. So that's a few of the other things that are around. And with that in mind, if you're looking at the i3 Mega, I'd say you need to ask yourself three key questions. The first of which, how much large or bulk printing do you think you're going to make? In my case, the answer is not a lot. I live in a bed sit, so I don't do multiple day prints. This means for me, a larger print bed would most of the time be a waste of money. If you, however, wanted to print large objects, say sizable household items, vases, that sort of thing, you would probably do better to get a large print bed. Also, if you want to print things in bulk, say you're a D&D sort of &D player, something like that, and you want to print an entire pub's worth of barrels, chairs and furniture in one go, 
set it up in the slicer, slap it up on the print bed and leave it running until it's done. In that case, a larger bed could be a bigger selling point. Secondly, how comfortable are you with building your printer? If you have decent electronic skill and are happy to take the time, there's a good chance you can get a cheaper printer, which in the end will get you a similar build quality with less strain on the wallet. And on the other hand, this is still a kit. While in my case, it went together simply and completely fine. If you're really uncomfortable with building these sort of machines, do you want to just say, well, I'll buy something that's already completely finished and then if it doesn't work out of the box, I can say, well, I'll hand it back. It's not my fault. It can't be my fault. That might be a thing of security that you might want to do. The last question, I think, is are you likely to tinker with your 3D printer? I like the technology, but I tend to use it in the way an engineer uses maths. For me, the beauty is in the end product. That's what I want to see, and I don't really mind what's going on in the background. For others, there's beauty in taking the machine apart, finding out how it works, and more importantly, finding ways to make it better. If you're one of these people, then the fact this is locked up tight, the fact it's difficult to improve, will become frustrating. Especially when you start hitting the limits of this machine's quality. And you're thinking, well, I want to do better, but I don't want to throw this out and replace it with a much more expensive model. So there you go. I won't say I've covered every detail, and I'm not going to give a final clear review or rating. I prefer to say, if this is what you want, it's good. If not, get something better suited to you. Best 3D printer doesn't exist. It's the one that suits your needs and your budget. However, I hope what I've said may have been helpful in some way. May have guided you towards making not a decision to buy this. I don't care personally if you buy this printer or another one. But hopefully I've helped you to make a decision with some rationality with some care, with some understanding about what you, what you want from a 3D printer and why you want it. So I suppose thank you for watching. Goodbye.